knight, thief, scholar, drifter, gambler. Farius Parfax will become whatever it takes to outwit the mages who destroyed her people. But when a wandering philosopher, gifted in the arts of violences, shows her instead how to defeat her enemies with compassion and cunning, Farius takes her first steps on the way of the Argosi. Join the incomparable Farius Parfax on a journey filled with swashbuckling action, spellcasting intrigue, and dazzling wit. And that is from Way of the Argosi by Sebastian de Castile. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. I'm delighted to be here. So give us a little bit of a background about this newest novel of yours and the inspiration behind it. For those of us who haven't dived in yet. <laughs> sure. Well, Way of the Argosi is actually a really good starting point for, for anyone who's you know kind of interested in, in reading my books or books set in this world. Um, there is a six book series called Spell Slinger, which is about a young guy named uh, Kellen, who's from a magical society and discovers his own magic uh, disappearing at the beginning of the series and has to figure out how to make a life for himself. And one of the people he meets along the way is, is this woman named Farius Parfax, who has no magic and yet is this very swashbuckling, swaggering gambler philosopher, <laughs> um, who uh, who sort of helps show him this other path through life that isn't about magic and power and everything else. And so um, Way of the Argosi is, is actually her origin story. So it's where we find out how she became um, this, you know, pretty remarkable person that we see in, in the other series. Um, so it came about in part because uh, when, when I first introduced the Argosi into the Spellslinger series, um, and the Argosi are kind of, for me, they're almost like the opposite of the Jedi, which is to say that, the, the, you know, to be a Jedi, you sort of have to be born with this um, alignment with the Force, and it's all about kind of renouncing a lot of the aspects of humanity, like don't fall in love or, you know, don't do these very human things like you try to be as as distant from human emotion as possible mm -hmm. and yeah. I, that always struck me as as really uncomfortable as, a, as an idea because it's sort of saying that the only people qualified to protect humanity are people who renounce a lot of what's amazing about human beings which is um you know our the way human beings use language and and the way we learn to use our really ungainly bodies for <laughs> dancing or martial arts or all these things so i wanted to create the argosi as a kind of order of people who embrace all of the fundamental uh human quirks and so in, you know instead of having magic they're what they do is they take the sort of what are called the seven talents which are things like eloquence and um and swagger and you know in defense and all these things and they and they really elevate those very human endeavors to these kind of um hyper kind of levels or the, the, the best they could be and 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 they don't have sort of lots of rules uh, they they have they have ways of doing things that they learn and so rather than being kind of militaristic which a lot of fantasy orders tend to be built yes. around a kind of military thing yeah so with, so with the Argosi, I wanted it to be that actually they, they almost can't work together mostly because every one of them chooses their own path. And as a result of choosing their own path, they, they, they sort of, you know, walk their own way through the world and they have certain things they hold in common, but, but they're, but it's, but it's the very opposite of a military order, like a knight or something like that. Mm -hmm. So when the Spellslinger books were coming out, I started getting all of these letters from readers who were, which were really heartfelt and, and really touching because it was often people who were in their teens or sometimes older than their teens who would mm -hmm. say, I haven't been able to find any kind of path through life. Like nothing makes sense to me. All the things my parents did or my grandparents did or the things that I, you know, people tell me or how you should be, um, don't work for me. I want to know how to be an Argosi. Like, tell me, tell me all the Argosi ways, which oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. But as a fiction author yourself, like, you know, right. That, we don't, we, we generally don't construct a philosophy and then, and then create a book around it. Right. Um, you know, that's sort of a polemic. Right. Um, and so I always have to say like, you know, look, there's no, I'm not an Argosi myself. So I, you know, I can't mm -hmm. you know, teach you that. Um, so when, when hockey, when I, when the spell singer series was finished and, and they wanted, uh, I was under an eight book contract and there were six spell singer books. We talked about different things. And one of the things that came up was let's, 
let's tell the origin of Farius Parfax and in so doing kind of explore this sort of notion of being an Argosi uh, and what that would mean. And, um, and for me as a writer, it, it, in part, it was a chance to explore what, what, what do those things mean? It's all set in the fantasy world, but how do they apply to some of the things that we wrestle with in our own lives, which of course yes. you know, everyone's always doing with fiction. So that's where mm -hmm. it came about. That's just so wonderful. I, for me, a lot of what drew me to fantasy and, you know, speculative fiction on a, on a broader sense was the roadmaps that you can discover when you're not expecting to, because, you know, we, mm -hmm. we turn to self-help books when we need, need mm -hmm. guidance, however, yeah. <laughs> however yeah. they, they work or don't. Um, and I think sometimes what we find in fiction is so much more powerful because we can absorb it in a way that's more effective. You know, we, we're, we're not expecting it. So we're not putting up these walls against what we could find there. And I, the, the way of the Argosi, like, like you're saying, it's, it's so individual is mm -hmm. sort of similar to something I discovered over the past few years, which is choosing to figure out who you are and then living that way with, with intention, you know, whatever that might be, you know, it's going to look different for, for every person and it'll change also, I think, as, as you develop as, as a human, that's, that's just really wonderful. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, for me, it comes from two, two places. I think the, the first was that when I was 16 years old, uh, I mean, I, I was, I was experiencing existential angst from a pretty young age, which I think mm -hmm. uh, probably we all do. Um, yeah. And, uh, and I was off by myself camping on an island uh, off the coast of British Columbia and I was waiting for a ferry and it was going to be like four hours and I had picked up this pocketbook of a, a novel by a guy named Keith Taylor who's an Australian writer who's, who's fabulous and he's still around and uh, yeah he's, he's a, and he's a lovely guy. He was the first author I ever wrote to and he was very generous and kind in his response. Um, so I was reading a book called Bard. Um, and it was about an Irish bard and it was about this figure who, you know, who travels the world going on adventures, telling stories, singing songs and, and swinging a sword. And I just went, this is what, you know, this is what I want to be. I want to be a bard. Yeah. <laughs> um, and there are no jobs for bards, unfortunately. It's, it's not a career uh, option. Um, but over the course of my life, I ended up doing all of these different things from becoming a traveling musician to going on lots of uh, trips uh, in different parts of the world to, um, to writing novels, to doing fight choreography as a fencer and, and things like that, um, where I realized that what I was doing was kind of putting together my path out of all the pieces because there was no one, there was no one who was going to offer me the here's the category you want to fit into which goes back to that same thing, right? About, you know, we keep looking for these sort of almost military orders in our life, like someone to tell us, no, this is the path, but, it, mm -hmm. but those paths almost never fit for a lot of us. Um, and the, and the second thing, which you alluded to, too, about, you know, um, kind of living authentically, that's a very existentialist notion, right? Like, you know, the, yeah. the, that old sort of existentialist kind of saw of like the world has, the universe has no meaning, nothing, it has no meaning to it whatsoever, which sounds nihilistic, except that the existentialist answer is, but humans need meaning. Therefore, you have to decide what's meaningful to you, and then you have to live authentically to it. And, and I've found that to be powerful. Yeah, yeah. So before we were recording, we were talking about how you're a very auditory person. And you're drawn to careers as, you know, a, a musician, you know, p performing in, in rock bands and as an actor and all of these very, you know, extra seeming um, career paths. And, you know, a lot of us as writers were sort of painted as these reclusive introverts. Um, and that's, you know, very true for, for myself. But what about, you know, this very seemingly isolating career? as a fiction author, what drew you to that, despite being this very outgoing um, persona? Uh, well, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, I'm actually not an extrovert in the sense that, you know, in the technical, I think the technical definition um, often has to do with whether you draw energy from social situations or whether you draw energy from solitude. 
And I tend mm-hmm. to draw energy from solitude and from performing. Um, and so I think there is a sort of a category now that people talk about, which is a performing introvert, which is someone who will hide in the corner at a party. But then if you put a stage there, they'll get up and they'll basically dominate all of the air. Um, so I, 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 I seem to fit a little bit into that category. I, I, I love performing. Um, uh, I don't know why. And I, music, I think it's partly because um, when you're in a band and you're playing, it, it engages all the different parts of you. It engages your, your, your head, your intellect, because you have to be, you know, be processing the music and what's going on and listening and, and paying attention to others. Um, and it engages your emotions very strongly uh, and it engages your body. So having all those things work at once is, is very appealing mm-hmm. to me. Um, and being, being a writer, I think, Uh, You know, I came to writing with a very, very skewed perspective, which was that when I was about eight years old or nine years old, it was after my father had died. My my mother took my brother and I aside and said, um, you know, your your father's pension isn't really enough for us to do well. And I'm going to need an easy way to make money. So I've decided to be a novelist. Um, And and she thought that she thought the easiest way to make money in the world was to write romance novels because they were so stupid and anyone could write them. Um, and then she proceeded <laughs> to write two romance novels. Um, and there, and, and to understand my mother, my mother was, uh, was quite a bit older when I was born and she had been in the British home guard during world war two, like in anti-aircraft. Mm-hmm. So my mother's notion of romance being very, very British of a very particular category <laughs> British person was that it should be above all other things sensible. Oh, no. <laughs> so imagine two romance novels written by a woman who thinks that romance should be sensible uh, and that romance novels are easy and anyone can write them. They're, they're, so there, no way in any world was a publisher going to take those two books. Oh my gosh. Um, however, I didn't know that at the time. And somehow she imbued in me that sense of, look, anyone can do this. You just sit down and do it, you know? Mm-hmm. Don't just, don't make a fuss. Just sit down and write a novel and make a you know and become rich and famous. And, <laughs> I wish it was um, that easy. <laughs> I know, and yet I think that that is a tremendous gift, right? Mm-hmm. That that perspective is a gift that we that we give to some members of our society, and we do not give to other members of our society. Um, and I'm not remotely qualified to talk about marginalization, so I so I won't, except to say that. When I was a kid, I remember the thing I most remember about being in elementary school as a young boy was that teachers wanted me, what I was taught was to, was that everything I did was important and Mm -hmm. I should take risks. And the little girls in my class were taught to not make a fuss and to care about other people. Mm -hmm. And both are are good sets of values. But if, but as you know, uh, I mean, as a writer yourself, you know that like if you wait in line all the time, if you just view writing as this career where, you know, everyone, you know, you, you need to not make a fuss and don't annoy any agents and don't get in the, don't bother any publishers and don't break any rules, then, then it's almost impossible to have a career. You yes. have to kind of, right. You, you know, so, so I inherited my mother's arrogance, thankfully, um, <laughs> And, and that helped, but, but just because I, I didn't properly answer your question about, about introversion and writing, um, writing, I think is, is wonderful f- for me in part because it offers both the solitude of the moment where you sit down to write, but also so many collaborative opportunities. If you're open to them as a writer, I love, I just, I, I, I love letting, you know, having my editors come back with ideas or criticisms or or anything like that. I've, I've been in rooms with, with sales teams and I mean, it sounds completely crass, but I'll say to them, like, don't has like, tell me what you like, like, what do you, what do you think is happening out there in the world? And it is important. I don't, I don't respond to it in the sense of them saying, all right, kid, here's what's really hot. Get me some <laughs> vampires and I want them sparkly, you know, but, but they'll, but they'll say things that they're encountering. And often they'll talk about the, the, the weird paradoxes of this is, big out there. But then this other thing that seems like the opposite is, is big out there. Um, and those things can kind of inspire your thinking a little bit. So I love the collaborative aspect of, of Mm -hmm. writing. I love the process of, you know, writing a a brief for the book cover. Um, I've been really lucky in traditional publishing and that I've always been allowed to participate in the cover design process. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. And, 
Yeah. And so I, you know, doing that and then seeing the rough drafts and of, of covers and, and the audiobook process, I adore, you know, the, the, there's, it's one of the absolute joys for me is when you hear the audiobook playback. And I, and mm-hmm. I have to say, Way of the Argosi. So Kristen Atherton is the audiobook narrator, and she's an actress and an audiobook narrator. And we didn't know who was going to be the voice of Farius Parfax um, when we started this because all the other books are narrated by a, a, a top notch guy named uh, uh, Joe Jameson, who's fantastic and brings the stories to life. But that's because those are first person narratives told from the perspective of a, of a male character, of right. Kellen. Um, and so he was the first person to voice various Parfax, you know, this, this woman in her late thirties, um, you know, who's this very swaggering kind of cowboy kind of, uh, figure. Mm-hmm. And so, but we couldn't do that with the young Farius with the story of the 16 year old girl discovering who she is. Like you don't want to listen to 11 hours of, of, um, <laughs> of some dude, you know, um, putting on his, his slightly higher inflected voice. Right. Uh, and so we were really nervous about how that was going to work out. And, and, um, the, uh, the producer did this thing where she sent, you know, they, they send you several options and she sent me like three options of, of narrator samples. And I know that she stacked it right. so that there would be one I would pick and the other two <laughs> that I wouldn't. Um, and the other two, they were, they were great too, but just not, but I, I just knew yeah. that who she wanted. And she was totally right. Cause Kristen Atherton, knocks this book out of the park i swear it's a different story like mm-hmm. I'm, i've been telling people you need you know pre-order the book but also pre-order the audiobook which sounds self-serving but it's so remarkable just what an actor can do in bringing the text to life and adding layers of of meaning to it like if you read the opening chapter way the argosi which is basically 11 year old Farius in a cave listening to her clan being massacred. Mm-hmm. And she's incredibly taciturn as a character because she's seen her parents die three years before. She thinks she's just going to die. And she's trying to tell you, she's trying to make the reader believe in a way that she's just, you know, there's nothing you can do. Life works out this way. This is how it is when it's you're fine. a refugee. Yeah. And it's, yeah. And so she's hiding her own trauma. And so, but when Kristen performs it, she delivers all those lines exactly the way that they're written, but she adds just with her breath, the reality underneath of this girl whose heart is beating incredibly fast, who's mm-hmm. trying not to sound, you know, crazed or, 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 or um, terrified, right. but who is clearly in trauma. So, so it's wonderful. And, and so it's those collaborative parts of being a novelist that I think are the most fun for me. Yeah, that's, I mean, it is such a collaboration. I think, you know, while a lot of these stories, you know, are are kind of ripped from a very personal place, you know, within each each author, you know, there there is a sense of once you send it out into the world, now it's touching a hundred thousand, you know, if if, if you're mm-hmm. lucky, other people, and drawing those same things from them, but you know, with with their own context, so when you do have this, you know, huge collaborative effort of, you know, editors and and narrators, you know, it's, it really adds all of these different facets to, you know, this, this one crystal that, that you started with. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why, and that's why I think, um, that's why one of the hardest things about the business of being an author isn't the the money part because if you you know if you if you apply some very basic business principles you know you can Mm -hmm. you can figure out the money part for good or for ill it's that (laughs) you it's that you really uh don't want anyone becoming part of the chain of the book who doesn't really believe in the story underneath or or doesn't understand it so hard now yeah or who doesn't understand it or, or you know and that's what's so hard right now. I mean, I see it with my friends who are self-published where, you know, a freelance editor only earns a, like the, 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 they're, they only earn a good living if they do a good job, but they do it quickly. Right. Right. Because if it takes them too long, if they're charging by the word, which most editors do now, most freelance editors, um, then, then they're just not making money. And, and that means it's sitting there reading the book and contemplating what's in the book and what the author might be trying to say for hours is, is a tricky endeavor. And 
you would think that traditionally published authors are protected from that problem because their editor's only job is to work with their books and the books of other people on their list. But they're so harried now um, because of contractions in the way publishing operations work. Basically, right. the people who run publishing firms have largely stopped trying to make more, you know, sell more books. What they're trying to do is pay less money to create right. those books. And so you always run the risk, whether it's with um, whether it's with the the your editors or your or the marketing department or the publicists, where they just they don't f- have the time. And as an author, you have to sort of go look. Nobody's allowed to touch this thing unless you actually care about it. If you don't mm-hmm. care about it, I'll find some other solution. Um, and yeah. so that that's the tricky part, right? You're so dependent on those collaborations. I had sort of a an interesting, and, and it took me a while to figure out what you know, what was rubbing me the wrong way about it. But I, I had a former critique partner and, you know, we were, we were very good friends and we could be very honest with each other, you know, which is part of what you really need with, with a critique partner. Um, especially, Mm -hmm. you know, when, when you're developing your craft pretty early on. And so we, we had that, but you know, she wasn't, um, she wasn't an epic fantasy reader. You know, the, what, what fantasy she, she did read was the sort of bodice ripper paranormal romance which you know Mm -hmm. those those are great but very different um and she would always say like oh well your your work is just like game of thrones and Mm -hmm. you know it 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 bugged me though i mean that's that's a nice comparison you know very very famous comparison here it Mm -hmm. it bugged me because i didn't see the the similarities other than this is simply an, an epic fantasy setting with multiple point of view characters, which, you know, could be true of hundreds and hundreds of books. And, mm-hmm. you know, when I when I sat down to really think about it after we had parted ways as critique partners, I realized that, you know, what what she wasn't understanding was the core of the story, you know, what what I was trying to say um, to, to whatever, you know, degree of success. Mm-hmm. But it was you know, one on, on one hand, we have this sort of bleak, you know, ev- everyone is doomed, n- no one's perfect, everyone's terrible kind of narrative. Um, and then I was trying to say almost the opposite. And she she just wasn't, you know, able to, to see that. And so it's so important, like you said, to have have someone who not only loves your work, and, you know, is you know, believing in it, but who also understands your point, even if you haven't quite gotten there yet. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, um, I'm in a, you know, I'm in a writer's group that I, you know, we've had together for like eight years Mm -hmm. and everyone's great in that, um, and lovely, but also, uh, you know, one of the things, I don't know if you've run into this, but I've been running into it recently, um, which is you have phases as a writer, you know, you have seasons as a writer, I guess. Mm -hmm. And, and you have these seasons where um, critique energizes you, right? And then you have these seasons where critique doesn't really energize you because you, whatever it is that you're doing right now, you sort of know what it is, and you sort of know what makes it work or not work. And it doesn't really ha- help to have people tell you why it's not working because you kind of already know, right? Um, and so you know, it, it can be it can be very tricky that way. But what you were saying about someone kind of not, you know, what I would, you know put in simplistic terms, you know, not getting it, right. you know, not getting what you're doing. That is, that's, I find an interesting phenomenon f- for two reasons. So one, because I believe in reader reception theory, mm-hmm. um, you know, just that, w- sorry, which is kind of a, a pompous way of, of saying <laughs> that the, the, the reader creates the story from the text, right. right? That, that I write a story, but that story is never recorded anywhere. It doesn't exist. It happens in my head and then it's gone and I, and I die. Like, the, you know, the old, what they say, the death of the author once the book is published. Because mm-hmm. um, all it remains is the text. And there is no correct way to interpret the text. Um, you know, the, the, what, however an author, uh, however a reader reads it, whatever pictures it conjures, that's the story. There's no other story you can give them. Right. And so author intent doesn't matter. And what I found a lot of the times with books like with my Great Coat series, which is, you know, sort of um, it's very, very swashbuckling fantasy. It's mm-hmm. it's it's kind of um, 
its its lineage is more out of the the old swashbuckling swashbuckling picaresque novels and and Hollywood movies than it is um, from sort of traditional fantasy. Mm-hmm. And people, you know, let's say a percentage of people will read that book and go, ah, oh, whatever, it's fine, right? And then a, right. and then a, thankfully, a larger percentage of people will read the book and go. This is really great, lighthearted, swashbuckling fun, you know, mm-hmm. and and I and neither of those groups actually gets it. And, and the second group is the ones that pay my bills, right? Like they're right. the ones that mean I get to have a great salary as an author. But neither group gets it. It's this third group that's so small that, and they're the ones who write you, and they're the ones that come up to you with a kind of almost a tear in their eye for at a book signing. Who, who will say, you know, when I read this thing, you know, it spoke to the idealism in me that I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to voice what I was feeling. And then I read the story and then the story like spoke to what I was feeling. Mm-hmm. And that's who we kind of write for, right? Like that's, yes. it's those people who like, they just get it, mm-hmm. you know? And, and, and it's not that other people, and I shouldn't say get it, it's a wrong phrase, right? Because it's not the other people don't get it. It's that, they they re- they read the story their way and they get what they need or want to get out of it. But you're always looking for the people who are like you, right? They're like mm-hmm. crying inside all the time over some injustice <laughs> in the world, and, and and then they read your story and they're like, you know, we are touching, like our spirits are touching on the same emotion, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. That's that's so true. It's and it's hard because, like you said, you know the the one group does pay your bills. And so you can't really say, well, you're not getting it because <laughs> they, they are getting part of it. And I, oftentimes I think of writing as, you know, I'm just asking my readers a series of questions and maybe I'm dropping some clues throughout the text about how I would answer those questions, you know, my myself, mm-hmm. but ultimately how they answer them is entirely up to them. And so I can't say you're, you're answering this question wrong when I've, when I've asked it in sort of an open-ended way, but I can say that's how I would answer it. Yeah, exactly. And, and, as, and I'm sure you find this too, like when you feel that temptation to be more explicit in your answer to those thematic questions, you feel yourself descending into polemic. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, and you said something you said, you, you, you mentioned earlier um, about sort of self-help books and, and self-help books and, and political books, not not to knock either of them because they can, I'm sure they can both be wonderful. But what they tend to do is they mythologize the real world. They mm-hmm. take the world that we live in, the concrete realities we're exposed to, and then they sort of mythologize them. They imbue a set of very myth, sort of you know mythological meanings to them, um, you know, with thing you know these kind of precepts. Um, whereas what I think fantasy writers try to do is take a kind of a mythological world. And make it real, make yes. it real enough that the reader can walk around in it and see what they think and then bring some of that back with them to their daily lives. And in that sense, I find fantasy is is in some ways more em- empowering mm-hmm. um, than, than self-help, for example, because fantasy just takes you to this other place, lets you walk around and see a world that is kind of constructed around whatever questions or themes the you know people have. Mm-hmm. And then come back and go, okay, now how do I want to look at my own world as opposed to telling people, this is what your world means, you know, like yes. this is what's really going on. So, yeah. I think, I think too, you know, sort of going back to what you were saying about marginalized people and, and how you can, you, you have this freedom with, with fiction, especially speculative fiction, you know, oftentimes the, when I talk to, to authors, cause of course we're, we're all usually readers as well. Um, you know, those of us who are marginalized, the first time we saw ourselves in a book, or, or I guess any, you know, any consumable media, but, but usually it's a book, it wasn't in that self-help book. It wasn't in that political book. It wasn't in that memoir. It was in a fantasy novel or a science fiction novel, because those were the people who were dreaming about worlds where we could exist and we could be the ones saving the world. And talk about empowering. I mean, that's, that's about as empowering as you can get when, you know, when your world is telling you that you can't be there. Yeah, it's, it, I, I hear you. And it, it's, it's interesting to me, because as I say, you know, I come from every, every possible intersection of privilege, save money, mm-hmm. uh, like other than money, you know, I have, right. I have all of the, 
Um, or, or as I would think of it, I, I get all of the defaults, mm-hmm. right? The way society is constructed around a notion of defaults. And, um, and so one of the weird things to me, you know, coming from that space is that um, there's a secondary kind of privilege in there as well, which is, uh, uh, so I never understood it when people would say, you know, if you can't see, if you can't see it, you can't be it. Or if, if right. it, not seeing themselves in books, because I would go, well, wait a second, you know, one of my favorite young adult books of all time is Dragon Song by Anne McCaffrey. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, right. And it, it, what's it about? It's about a 16 year old girl named Mentally who's who is prevented from becoming a, a, a minstrel, a harper, because she's a girl mm-hmm. and she's 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 oppressed on the basis of, of her gender. Um, and I completely related to it, even though I was a boy, nobody was preventing me from doing anything. But but McCaffrey's such a great writer that I just felt like I know I'm I'm, I'm in touch with this feeling. And and it's and so it, it's only in recent years and, you know, I'm, I'm old as dirt now. I'm, <laughs> I'm in my 50s. Um, it's only in recent years where I go, oh, that's kind of one of the one of the weird privileges of being the default, or being kind of placed as as the default. That it 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 makes it kind of almost easier to sort of go, oh, I can imagine myself as this. I can imagine myself as that because you've never had to be those things, right? right. So you've ne- so it's a very strange kind of way it works. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, Though, I don't know. In a, in a lot of ways, with you know her her books, especially her arc there, you know, you, you were also being told you, you can't be a bard. There's, there's no job that's a bard mm-hmm. or, or a harper as, as the case may be. Mm-hmm. So I, I do see where, you know, maybe, maybe little baby you <laughs> was saying, well, I, I am being told I can't be this, but you know, I, you know, I, I, I guess I can see it too, you know? Yeah. I, I think maybe that's part of it. You know, I think uh, when we're, when we're writing, especially we're, we're writing about people who, who aren't exactly like us, we sort of have the two choices, right? You try to write from the standpoint of what makes people um, different from one another, or you try to write um, people, you write, try to write from the standard of, um, uh, of, of what we sort of all of the, of what we all have in common, which is largely emotions, right? right? We don't have, we don't share circumstances. We, we, we share emotions. Um, and I, I think it was, was it Louise Ehrlich who wrote The Roundhouse, which is this kind of fabulous, very strange sort of pseudo mystery novel set on a reservation. Um, and it's this 14 year old kid who's who's trying to solve the mystery of who, you know, uh, who raped his mother uh, on this reserve. And it's a very dark subject. Mm-hmm. And yet she approaches it from the standpoint of this this these these teenagers who are who are obsessed with star trek and and (laughs) and things like that and and when you read it you sort of go i have no idea what it's like to be uh an indigenous person living on a reserve in the united states um but i know what it's like to be lonely right and so when he's feeling lonely i i can connect to that i know what it's like to be scared when he's feeling scared I, i i can relate to that and i think mccaffrey did that as well i think a lot of great writers do this has been the first half of our interview with Sebastian de Castell. Tune in next week for the second half. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>